That's good. Okay. Hi, I'm Michelle. Uh, this is my so-called Handmade Life podcast. I have a blog. I've had it for about 10 years um, called My So-Called Handmade Life and uh, dot com. And then I'm on Ra uh, Ravelry as Mamatronic and I'm on Instagram as My So-Called Handmade Life. So I got a lot of responses to the questions about and talk about slow living last week and the week before. Um, I'm going to draw for the winner tomorrow. Today is Wednesday when I'm filming, but I said I would draw Thursday, so I'm going to wait one more day to actually draw the winner, and there may be more people that comment, but I can at least in this episode, because this is the only day I've got to do this, I can uh, record, talk about the things you said. I'm really interested in the ideas some of you had and the ways you're incorporating the slow living thing into your life. And I'm excited that you guys are excited about it, too. Um, and there was some convicting comments, too. I, it, I saw things that people, you know, have noticed in their life. I've noticed in mine, too. And I was like, you know, that's something I'm still doing or I need to get rid of completely. But um, I did start my um, organization. Remember, um, I talked about do we want to add things to our life or do we need to edit? And I began editing, definitely. I am. I'm looking for my little notes here. I wrote down a lot of what you guys said, so I have a big mess of papers on my lap. My start was slow, but it was good for me. I listened to a few more episodes of that podcast. I feel like I'm just going to become the commentary on <laughs> the Slow Home Podcast. I'm not, but it's great, and I've been. It's been coming on automatically when I get in my car. You know, it syncs up with my phone. Um, but I, what I did was I listened to one of their episodes and uh, and then I read a little something on a website or something, maybe about a hoarder, <laughs> and I was just like, oh my gosh, I'm just going to go straighten up. It's like I, I felt dirty, like I needed to hurry and clean up, you know. Um, I went in my closet and I, I actually went out in the garage and I have like a, a Rubbermaid tub of clothing in one size and another one of clothing in another pulled them down and I took out things I thought you know even if I fit in these because I told you I'm kind of I've been losing weight slowly which is the right way to do it I'm not trying to lose weight uh, just like I wasn't trying to gain it but I wasn't well and my hormones went crazy with stress and now that they're settling down I'm finding the weights coming off even on weeks where pff, we've been so busy we just ate crap out at restaurants um, it continues to come off so that's kind of how I know this is a normal healthy thing it's slow so if that keeps happening I'm keeping stuff that will fit me I don't want to go buy a whole new wardrobe so I went through those boxes of one size and then another and uh, pulled out things you know if all of these things in this box fit me I wouldn't need them all you know I basically wear a pair of overalls and a pair of jeans the same ones all the time uh, the summer it's like the same two cutoffs you know um so i took out things i knew i just probably won't wear and i gave them away they were in good condition um there were a few things that i thought you know the quality of this isn't great i want to learn to sew this is the kind of sewing project i would do as a beginner got rid of those two to give them away there were a few things that were falling apart because they had been stored for so long like maybe they were resale shoes anyway but the soles you know, or coming off a pair of shoes. And and then there were shoes like Target shoes that I bought several years ago. I don't really trust them to wear them because they're not high quality shoes. And um, actually I wore a pair to my daughter's graduation. And uh, as I was going to leave, I said, you know, I haven't worn these shoes. I don't wear heels very often. It's like, I haven't worn these in a long time. I just feel, I felt weird about wearing them. So I, uh, I brought an extra, I had a big, you know, tote bag type purse. I brought an extra pair with me. But the ones I was wearing looked best, you know, with the dress. At, at the stadium where her graduation was held, uh, a heel came off. So that was easy. I just threw them in my bag and pulled the other ones out. And I was so thankful for that warning, you know, that I needed another pair of shoes. But I got rid of those kind of shoes because I don't need them. I have enough quality shoes. Really? Uh, 
put them in the giveaway pile or trash if they weren't in good shape. And then I organized. Um, I gave my husband back his half of the closet. I thought that was really big of me, really big of me. He didn't even notice. I totally didn't have to do it. Um, I made sure, okay, all of my drawers, I can like open my drawer and I can like put two hands in. I could, you know, I have space. I'm not shoving down and pushing in. And when I open my closet, I don't have to like rake the clothes to the side and stick something in quick and close it before the, you know, the shoulders come off of the hanger. There's like space between my clothes now. I'm really happy about that because what I got rid of in the boxes that were in my garage, I just took things in my closet that I did love. I thought these probably will fit me in three months or whatever. I put them in those boxes. They don't fit me now, but they're going to. And so they're waiting. And then when my body, I'm looking for my son, when my body settles down, I'll really be able to do a great purge, I think. Um, but I do want to be sure. Because the thing is, this whole health deal has gone on like for eight years, seven years. Um, I mean, I'm like almost a decade older. <laughs> and everyone says you gain weight as you get older. Or your body shaping just changes. So I don't know what to expect. So I'm just, um, I'll be ready. But when it seems like things have stabilized, um, I'm excited to go ahead and get rid of those rubber tubs out in the um, garage. I also organized my stash. I didn't really plan on doing that right away, but I wanted to look for Lopi that I knew I had. I'm um, trying to use what I've got, which is something we talk about in this episode, and a lot of you were mentioning um, in your comments last from the last week and the one before. Uh, but, like I said, I'm looking for over, a little more oversized sweaters. I didn't have um, sweater quantities that were oversized enough. So I needed like two more balls of Lopi. So I went looking for what I had and uh, man, I searched high and low. I really only have my yarn in that one spare bedroom. But then I remembered when we had someone stay in that bedroom after the hurricane, I had moved a box under my bed. So. I found it, but while I was at it, I was like, you know what? It's really dumb to have Patton's moss green heather here and then some over here. And so I went and I combined everything that was the same colorway, same type. It's much more organized and I feel good about it. I also started thinking about what I want to do with that room. I do want to keep the bed that's in there as a spare bed one day, but um, my son is going to be, he's made a choice about college. It's local, but he will be living on campus. And um, we haven't had anyone stay over, but maybe once a year, the last couple of years. So um, I may just move that bed out of that room for now. And then when one day when he has really actually moved out of our house, um, it can be pulled back out and made into a true spare bedroom. His room is a really great, uh, a really great small bedroom for a tiny house. It's got a Murphy bed that my husband made and it's like a built-in cabinet with bookshelves and stuff. It's where I want to sit and knit one day. Um, the light in that room is good too. It's really small. It's more of a pass-through room but we made it into a bedroom and uh, it would be a nice extended living area. So when that day comes we'll have that bed for the other room but right now I think I'm gonna remove it and bring in a couch and uh, we have another couch and just make it a place where I, maybe I can just do this and set these lights and the stand up and not have to worry with the dogs weaving in and out. Um, I just wanna make it a little more livable. But anyway, I felt so great and so super organized. But like somebody mentioned in the comments, um, Sarah, how addictive it can get to just start editing. Now I'm looking around, it's been one week. I'm looking around, it hasn't even been a week. I'm looking around and thinking, oh, there's more I need to get rid of and more and more. I think it's, that's a good thing, I guess, to be addicted to. Um, I'm seeing the need to go a little further and a little further with it. I cleared off my computer desk. I cleared off my table. Um, everybody's been helping me too. My husband and my son have both been keeping things pretty neat around the house. So. That was my first step. I did some easy 
cleaning some surfaces and purging of uh, some things from the closet. And it's all very livable now. Our room is, you know, wash day is not going to be totally obnoxious trying to put things up. I did make one mistake though. I had like two bags, uh, trash bags of this clothing to give away and my daughter and son-in-law came in to celebrate her birthday this weekend and she was looking through the, um, the bags and I looked through with her. And I shouldn't have done that because like I pulled out, a, um, she pulled out this t-shirt that I really loved. It was like a cropped t-shirt from the first time I saw Natalie Merchant in concert. It's a really cool t-shirt. But it had been washed with something, oh no, no. It, it had been exposed to flood water in the garage uh, and a red Taekwondo belt ugh, made it bleed uh, all over, bled red all over the shirt. But it actually kind of looked tie-dyed and they were both like, that's cool. And I was like, she was like, I can't believe you're getting rid of that. And I was like, man, I want to get rid of it. So I pulled it out and one other little thing. And I thought that's probably a mistake to go back and look at it. Once I've made the break and I feel good about it, if I go back and look at it, I'm just going to start reintegrating it into my home. So, but she got a few things out of that bag. And here's the really good thing. It was so hard to let go. And I didn't let go of that Natalie Merchant t-shirt. Like, I'm going to go get it. <laughs> yeah, this was, um, I don't remember which album. I mean, it must have been her first album when it had come out. Or maybe Ophelia. Yeah, I don't remember. I think I've only seen her in concert once. And I saw 10,000 Maniacs twice. Anyway, I mean, this is a neat souvenir. Of course, now it looks kind of tie-dyed, but you know. And it's super cropped. This totally, I would feel totally stupid in this right now. Of course, it doesn't fit me really right now. I'm not a size concert t-shirts. A size small is actually a size triple small. I'm not either. So <laughs> anyway, I probably made a mistake of looking through things with her, but what I did do when I was knitting the edge sweater, which is the one I'm giving the pattern away for today on this episode, um, I was thinking of my daughter the whole time. The color of the yarn, I just thought, oh, she's going to really like this. I probably ought to knit her one of these. But I only had the two skeins, you remember? And it made it come out a little smaller than I wanted it for me. I wanted it wider, bigger for me. But my daughter is very tall. She has a long torso, long arms. So sweaters I make for me now, I didn't think they would fit her in arm length very much. Because she really likes, she likes to have a little extra too around her wrist. So... Um, but you know, it was her birthday. I didn't have anything handmade or special to give her really. I mean, we we're just taking her out and give her a little money, you know, but, um, which she didn't expect anything. But I just said, hey, would you try this on for me? I just wanted you to try it on. And she's probably thinking I wanted her to pose for pictures because I do that to her sometimes. If it's something that she can fit in and if she's willing, um, she said, why? are you getting rid of this? I said, well, I mean, I'd like to make you one that fits you. I just need to know how much more length I need. But she put it on and it fit her perfectly. I guess it was oversized enough on me to be good on her. It's oversized in fit. There's ease, but the length is still good for her. And uh, I was so happy. I was so, she was so excited. It's, it's the best thing she said that I've knit. That's the, she likes it more than anything else I've made. So um, that was an easy one to give away. And that was brand new and I loved that sweater, you guys, but I felt so excited to give it to her. I mean, I was squealing with excitement. Um, also, just to uh, make something that my kids like, that's kind of a big deal because they're both like, meh. It was just, it's a great design, you know. And if you uh, left a comment, you really know because uh, you want it. <laughs> Um, so that was an easy one to give away while my sad little Natalie Merchant t-shirt was really hard and I just couldn't give it away. But, um, I looked up different things you guys had to say in the comments and, um, bear with me as I try to, uh, 
kind of read through your uh, different the thing I asked was if you were into slow living, if you liked the idea, and where is the first place you would start? Um, some of you have already started and you shared what you started with. Others of you are like, this is what I need to do next. And some of you are like, ugh, I need to do it all and I need to start now. So Pammy had said that she's recently retired, has the time and wants the slow life, definitely. Um, for her, it's about prioritizing based on her values. She doesn't want to just do busy work, um, to be busy all the time. She wants to do things that are, mean something to her. But her next step for organization will be her sewing and crafting room. I gotcha. Um, Braden Tinker was saying, um, cutting down on work hours. That would be what she would do to um, totally slow down life, which I, I get that. Uh, that's where I think a lot of people feel like, um, well, they go to work. And I mean, Leah of the All You Knit Is Love podcast, she said her work life is so hectic that when she comes home, all she wants to do is be slow. She doesn't want to do anything quick. She doesn't even want to knit quickly. If it stays a whip for a month, hey, that's fine. She loves it and she loves working on it slowly. She said even her cooking, she chops the food too slow in her family's mind. Um, but she just likes being calm and slowing down. And I can see how important that is. I mean, I was starting to get stressed out about something today and I just breathe. <laughs> you know, people do that and say that all the time. But I mean, I realized I was holding my breath. Um, so Yes, it's cutting down on work hours, I hear you. Um, Stacy was saying that she's already living the slow life to a great degree. Um, she's working part-time, and she likes the, her quiet life that she's living with her husband. Her kids are grown now, and she loves that quiet life they live. Um, but that sort of makes it seem as though life slowed down for you when your children grew up. Is that the case, Stacy? Um, I think a lot of people feel that way. That, yeah, when I retire, then you know I can finally slow down, and I can see how that would be easier. I mean, there's another comment in here. I'll get to it in a minute, where um, they said that was how it was for them, and so enjoy that time because pretty soon kids are getting married, and there's grandkids, and things busy up again. So there's a lull there, and it's good to kind of have some selfish time to, you know take care of yourself, get things together, live slowly. Uh, Stacy also wants to start a weekender sweater. Um, yeah, I'm almost done with mine and I love this pattern. You're gonna enjoy it a lot. Um, Christina was saying that just being in the moment is what slow living is for her. Any excess stimuli from the outside or just stuff from within, it can disrupt that mindfulness and enjoying where you are right now. Um, Gail was saying, with older kids, um, just, she has older kids also, she's just taking, um, taking this organization and mindful living just one step at a time, just in one small area at a time, maybe clearing out and organizing a couple of drawers here and there, a couple of cupboards, you know. But like me, I said the books, the music, the yarn. I really don't want to edit very much of that. Um, I did give away some Lion Brand type yarn. It was it, it looked like something you would make baby knits out of. Um, that and a lot of acrylic, uh, purple and white acrylic. I thought I was going to make football team themed stuff that I never did. I don't know what I was going to make, but I didn't do it. And uh, I mean, that wasn't expensive yarn. It was like. They're big skeins, they were like a dollar each. That's why I got a bunch of them, but someone will enjoy it. Um, but she wants to keep, Gail wants to keep her books and her yarn, but she does want to reorganize that area. Um, and it's Gail, it was Gail who was saying, hey, that time where your kids are grown up and they're leaving home or they're older, enjoy that because there's like a new a cycle that comes later where your life gets busy again, which I'm seeing with some of my friends. Um, 
And uh, she also was interested in these health issues that I've, I guess I've alluded to them. Um, you know how it is with women's health. Some things it's really hard to find a definite, this is what happened and this is why, because so many things work together with your hormones and everything, your foods you eat, stress. But she wanted to know a little bit more about it and I am going to talk about that more later. Um, I think that it, the slow living concept has a lot of bearing on our health and it's just going to come up, definitely, Gail. Um, Birch Point, um, she was saying, uh, in the process of, she is in the process right now of moving to Maine. Man, Maine is so beautiful. I visited a friend there one summer for like, I don't know, five days a week. It was so beautiful. We stayed in a, um, a little, like, I guess you call it a, a cottage, a beach home, you know, close to the water. And it's those homes, they're not, they're like our beach cabins actually here in Southeast Texas, but they're quaint and they're beautiful and ours are not. <laughs> well, you know, since we've had so many hurricanes, um, people, uh, beach property has become really expensive and most of the homes being built are really nice now, but they used to all be a little ramshackle, but it was always fun. You know, you would borrow somebody's beach house and it was always kind of rough and um, 80s, pastel decor and uh, I don't know just one giant room full of beds um, the this was a cottage with an upstairs downstairs two bedrooms maybe three and it was just quaint and beautiful um, anyway I loved that I loved being near the water it was beautiful there um, anyway that's where um, she's moving to and she was saying that they um, this home is like half the size of the one that they've lived in and raised their family in. So they're having to get rid of things, like major things, big furniture, things that just wouldn't even fit in that house. And it's hard to do, to let go of things with memories attached. And I can imagine, I can imagine that. Um, I really haven't had to let go of anything with memories of my children attached yet, you know. Um, not really furnishings or, um, you know, we're still living in the home that they were little in. But once she gets rid of these things, gives them away, she does feel free, like unburdened and ready for this new chapter in her life, which I think is exciting. And man, what a chapter it's going to be. You're going to have, um, she's going to have Acadia Park, like in her backyard, which I've read is one of the most beautiful national parks we have in the states I, i've never been i was supposed to go when i visited that friend but she changed her mind so we didn't go um but oh good luck to you elizabeth um and then elizabeth streeter said that um i can't read my handwriting <laughs> my handwriting's bad <laughs> Oh, she's quitting the rat race this year, which makes me think you're either leaving your job or retiring from your job. But anyway, congrats to you. And that's going to help her slow her life down. Um, and it's just going to be great to sleep past 4 a.m., which, yeah, that would be great. Uh, I've never had to get up that early, except, you know, for weird vacation times we were leaving or something. Um, more sleep knitting and sewing and creating all at her own time schedule that's what she's looking forward to but she felt like the first few weeks of that time where she's not working she will need to get organized cut down on the clutter and that's where her slow living is going to begin with the editing things out and organizing things Tammy was saying that slow living to her means using what she already has and living in the moment, just enjoying every breath, every sunrise, every sunset. She struggles with clutter and not finishing things. And by clutter, she said, you know, she does need to declutter in her home, but it's also mental clutter. And that's something I mentioned last week that I get overwhelmed with things, especially to do's. Um, if it's a to do that I'm not accustomed to, like, um, a responsibility I'm nervous about, like um, 
hosting a team dinner. This is the first year I've done that, and I was nervous about what do I feed these boys? What will they like? I mean, I kind of have always insisted, you know, my kids eat some vegetables, and they've had a pretty uh, broad appetite. They like, you know, whatever, and they're they're always accept gratefully whatever's made for them. But most guys aren't like that, you know. I felt a little nervous, like, what if I don't cook enough, or you know, of course we had too much, but. And I didn't cook at all. We actually bought some, um, had a restaurant do some of the food to take the burden off. And then I didn't have to stress. It was one less clutter in my mind. That's the kind of thing that gets me nervous and anxious and I can't think straight, you know. But uh, things like that, or I had to speak about that mission trip in front of my church. And I didn't feel weird or nervous talking to you guys about it, but I felt uncomfortable standing in an auditorium and talking into a microphone, 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 you know. So I find that that, that mental clutter, just more things to do, more things to do, it creates an anxiety sort of in me. Um, just too much to do, too much is being asked of me. I think I'm somebody who needs like one thing a day beyond the norm to focus on. If there's too much, I just start to feel overwhelmed. That's probably an introversion issue. Um, because, uh, I mean, I'm always balancing a lot of things at once, but just things that involve being out there in front of people, um, uh, people I don't know, um, where I'm, I'm responsible. I just feel nervous that I will fail or not do a good job. So anyway, I'm just curious what, Tammy, what your mental clutter you're talking about is. I think also just our constant, you know, thumbing through our phones and looking at stuff, 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 stuff. And it's a lot of information, not necessarily bad, but it's just so much. Your brain's kind of cluttered up and then you can't even notice how do you feel? Well, what do I think? Well, how was my day? I, you can't think about it because I'm taking in all this information. So anyway, I hear you on that. Um, Frauke was saying that for her, slow living, and this is good, begins with thankfulness. Um, she's trying just to take a moment and look around and be thankful for her family, her dog, her home, uh, nature around her, her garden, you know, just a shadow on the wall, a friendly person that she meets and her faith. I really like that. My son is trying to make me laugh. He's walking behind the camera in a tiptoeing like this. I'm going to turn the camera on him next time. Um, I like that, Frauke. I think that um, that is really the foundation for our uh, mindful living, is to first be grateful for the life that we have. I mean, why would we want to take care of it and cultivate it or curate our time if we don't even realize what we've got? taking stock of what we truly have, which, you know, Tammy's talking about using what you've got. Um, a lot of that means things that we have. Let's finish what we've got. Let's take care of what we got. Just like I was saying, a lot of my slow living will just be maintaining my home well, taking care of my pets right, my family, my body right. But the same with thankfulness. Um, when we're thankful for these things, then we'll want to take care of them. Um, but we have to stop and just remember, look at what I've got. Um, so, you know, life can't pass her by while she's doing this, and it uplifts her as a stay-at-home mom um, to teenagers. And I'm thinking, you know, I find that the stereotypes of teenagers, just, they're, they're not always true, but it can be a difficult time, and there's a lot of negativity and all that's going on inside of you and in your life when you're that age. How good to have someone who's practicing thankfulness in the home with you. I'm sure that must rub off on the kids, and that's really good. Um, I just think, uh, you know, she said life takes on a larger meaning when you're thankful for what you've got. And then she savors it. You know, every moment is something you can savor. I like that a lot. Cosmic Knitter says, she needs to start editing everywhere right now. <laughs> she has small home issues like me and uh, two big boys and a big hairy dog. So I hear you and you can do it. You can do it. Um, 
those podcasts and books that I mentioned, um, probably a good place to start. Like for me, every time I get in my car, the Slow Home podcast starts up and they've actually turned me on to several others. And so it's just every day, a little for a few minutes, I get a, um, a reminder of a way, you know what, yeah, I, I could get rid of such and such or organize differently. Um, Melanie said that she likes to slow life down with summer camping. You know, things have to go slow motion when you're camping. <clears throat> Be kind of unplugged. Now, I have to say, I've had one camping experience that was the opposite of that. Um, we were going to go to the Guadalupe River for probably spring break one year. No, it was in the summer. It was Father's Day. And uh, I haven't been down the Guadalupe tubing in Texas. That's a big place to go drink and you know, you've got your cooler floating by you and you go down. Stop it. Stop it, Ella. The dog is batting the thing with her nose. <laughs> um, uh, you go tubing, you know, like I, I went tubing when I was a teenager, when I graduated with a friend and we went down the Guadalupe and we camped beside it. Two girls by ourselves. It was totally safe. It was no big deal. But in the years since... 92. <laughs> it has been um, a real party place. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's not surprising to see someone topless and girls, you know, and uh, people floating with their beer, drinking and stuff. Um, I've heard of some things, dangerous things happening, but um, we didn't realize this, okay? But we, we did look for a family campground, and we, we went online and found this one place, and uh, I mean, we should have known <clears throat> because their website was playing Whiskey River by um, Willie Nelson in the background. But anyway, we called them and asked if they had a fa if it was a family environment because we were bringing young kids and they said, sure. Oh, absolutely. So when we get there, I mean, nothing bad happened there, but it made me think of, um, you know, TV shows in the 60s where they would show this colorful ghetto, you know, where everyone, you know, colorful buildings and, and there's people everywhere and it's all types of noises and sounds and, and from one block to the next you hear different kinds of music. That's what that campground was like. The, the, the tents were right next to each other. You could barely walk through them. I think that the sites had been broken up, each site into more than one site. They didn't all have a fire pit um, or a grill anywhere to cook food and somehow, I mean, there was electricity. So there were people running fans, there were people with guitars and amps, um, radios playing all over, different kinds of music. As you moved, you heard it. Um, there was a lot of drinking, beer bongs, and, um, <clears throat> but it was a lot of families, it was, but it was not the great outdoors at all. It was crazy. And we went to sleep that night and, um, Gosh, I'm not going to even say all of the goofy things that happened. We went to sleep, and I didn't even want to get up and go to the bathroom, because there's like three bathroom stalls for this huge campground, tons of people, more people than should have been in there. Um, and I waited the next morning. I just dreaded getting up and trying to navigate tubing with this whole mess of people around us. We got up, we slept late because we got there late. We slept till like 10. It was a Sunday. There was nobody there. I mean, the place had emptied out completely while we were sleeping. I guess they all had to go home. So we were by ourselves and it was great. We went tubing and, uh, but that was my, that was one camping trip that was not slow motion at all. Of course, you know, another family came that day and we have the entire giant campground. They actually picked the site right next to us and set their tent up. <laughs> then they started fighting. But uh, normally, Melanie, I agree with you. Camping forces you to be slow-mo, unplugged, get in tune with nature and your body. But her point was that, you know, every activity when you're camping requires extra effort. Like even getting fresh water requires some work, you know, feeding yourself, everything. So, um, 
she applies that mentality to her everyday life. You know, she's trying not to go shopping unless it's necessary. And she's found when camping, and they forgot soap, <laughs> there's a lot that really isn't a necessity that we think is. And she had a great time even without soap for four days, you know. Um, we did that once too, but it was uh, cooking utensils. And my husband would laugh that I made a list. Right before we leave, I'd make a quick list and just check off, do we get it all? Well, he, you know, he picked on me and I said, okay, fine, hey, I can wing it, whatever. We had zero, I mean, we didn't have a pan, we didn't have our knives, we didn't have a skillet, I mean, a um, spatula, but uh, anyway, we may do though, we were fine. Um, it's true though, a lot that you think is a necessity really isn't, and that camping mindset is really good for life. So she said her lifestyle just, she feels healthier this way. Um, I was listening to uh, Katie Bowman talk, and she does this thing she calls nutritious movement. She's all into biomechanics of the body, and she says that our bodies actually need to move certain ways. It's like nutrition that we actually need for our well-being, for everything to work, not just the right hormonal responses and good sleep, a feeling of calm and peace. We can kind of get that, you know, when we exercise. But little things like, um, you know, your feet need to feel uneven terrain. Um, it's like it's a workout for the feet. It helps all these muscles and things. It helps your body in ways you don't realize. Anyway, anyway, in her talk about nutritious movement, she talked about how this big conundrum in modern life is that we don't get enough exercise and everyone's trying to find ways to incorporate healthy movement for their body, for their mind, for their back, for their this and their that, but they have jobs. Where do they fit it in? And she realized one day, you know, she was doing squats, and she realized, you know, if I just got rid of my couch and sat on the floor, I'd do like 20 squats, you know, I'd be doing this all day long. And so she did. And pretty soon they're getting rid of most of their furniture and they have a very utilitarian, and I'm not, I know you guys aren't going to want to do this, but a minimalist approach to everything to encourage more movement in a modern world where you can't, you know, get out and maybe say you work a nine to five job. When you come home, how can you handle things in such a way that you get the healthy movement that you need? Well, Melanie's talking about it. things take longer. But it's, there's a joy to doing that when you're camping. Well, I think that can be had, too, at home. I'm sure you would agree, Melanie, and that's kind of what you're applying to your life, is uh, uh, going a, a more roundabout way, maybe a more old-fashioned way of doing things, and uh, you find that you move more, it's more meditative, and you're definitely thinking about what you're doing. You're just not relying on modern convenience for everything. That Katie Bowman, I'm going to put a link. I put links to everything beneath the window um, on YouTube, but I also do it on my blog because I want to talk about, like, books and, you know, websites and things and get your opinion, so I'm going to have links for all that always. Um, so Sarah had a, a really good uh, response to this. She said that she's been on a slow living journey for a couple of years, but she's ready to move from the, just the decluttering phase. She's done decluttering and organizing and actually said it was addictive, which I can see now how that would be because, like I said, I, I cleaned so much last week and I felt really great about it. Like, whew, I won't need to do this forever. And it's been a week and I'm like, you know, I think I could go a little further and get rid of this, this, and this, you know. So she went, she's through that phase. She's, she's done it. And now she's needing to go on to um, decluttering like in her priorities, her motivations, determination, and her follow through, which she sees is harder. I think that is harder. Um, just considering how her time is spent. She may even quit one like her part-time job, one of them, to have more time for herself and her husband to hike. And I was thinking, that's really cool. I mean, hiking sounds like a, a little vacation-y thing to a lot of people, but it's actually really necessary. I have to get out and walk regularly. Um, not just for my body or my back, but for my mind. Only, 
I don't necessarily get to go anywhere this beautiful. And I think if I lived somewhere with beautiful nature around me, that I think that's the thing I would most want in the world. I think I would be willing to retire and live extremely simply to have nature around me. So do you guys think that is wise to turn down the opportunity to make more money so that you can hike more? I do. If it's good for your well-being, if it cements relationships, if it helps you have peace of mind and better health, I think that's great. But I think my parents' generation, everyone I know in that generation would be like, that's crazy. Wait till you're 65 and then you can hike all you want, <laughs> you know, which I don't really agree with. Um, I also think my daughter's generation, you know, I'm so sick of the word millennial, but I think they would find quitting a part-time job so that you have more time to be outdoors completely sane, wise, they would. And that's something I think, um, I, I like that. It's a, they have a work ethic. She does. Her husband does. But they never want a lifestyle that requires them to work all the time. And I love that about them. So go, go for it, Sarah. I hope that you're able, whether you quit that job or not, to find the time to do that. Um, also, uh, meditation and yoga is something that she's uh, wanting to work on and do more. But her biggest revamp to her crafting life, she found herself, and Sarah had a podcast. I'm going to flash the name under here. I'd heard of it, but I'd never watched it. I didn't really get into watching lots of podcasts until the last year. Um, and even then, I really can't keep up with them all, which, I mean, obviously Sarah was having trouble with that. She just found herself caught up in this you know it, you know how it is. If you watch other podcasts, and I'm sure you do, you see the stuff, you see the yarn, uh, especially if people are selling things. And this is culture you can get caught up in where you want to buy. So it was like, you know, uh, you buy it and you consume it. And then you see it more, buy more, consume more. Or in her case, she was seeing it, buying it, and then partially consuming it. Because before she could finish making what she had started, she saw something else buy it and start something new and then see something else and you know so she stopped her podcast I bet it's a good one too she cut her Instagram following she doesn't follow any shops on Instagram anymore which it can be a problem you guys you know it can to have all this beautiful stuff and I'm offering it a discount with this code just for the weekend um, She's going cold cheap, which you guys probably know means she's not going to be buying anything. She's going to be using the wool, the yarn that she already has so that she can actually enjoy the things she has and make the things she's been wanting to make for a long time without getting distracted by something new. So um, just doing that, she said she is amazed at how much healthier her relationship to the craft has become. I like this and Sarah you really got me to think for a few months I've been saying I have a problem to my husband about yarn you know the truth is I don't really spend that much on it not really now to some people it might seem like a lot but I don't I don't do other things I don't get haircuts I don't get the nails done I mean I get haircuts every once in a while I don't shop a lot we don't eat out all that much um, so it's kind of relative but you know what if your reasoning for doing it isn't healthy does it really matter how much you're spending i think that it's it's just more than i needed to because i didn't need the things um in fact i found out i had a, a lot after a year of when i saw it i would impulse buy usually it's a coupon code or something i would see on instagram and i would buy it or it's a beautiful color or oh i would love to make this thing and I found I was doing it when my grandmother was not well, still alive with me, and I didn't have a lot of time to make things. It was like buying it was sort of a placeholder for later. This means, this assures that I will get to make that thing. I bought that yarn with it in mind, but then the time wasn't coming. And pretty soon I have this massive collection of fingering weight yarn, and I'm a sweater knitter, 
you know. And there, I can knit sweaters, but you know how it is. Two skeins of something, that's not going to be a sweater. Um, so now I'm back to making a lot, you know, have more time to make anyway. I'm not making a ton. And I, I didn't have much sweater quantities of yarn or sweater weight yarn. Um, I just had a lot of fingering weight though. All of it I would love to make those things, but my point is I couldn't responsibly make them quickly enough to justify how much I was buying, you know. So that was convicting for me. I mean, I knew that I was doing that already, and I think when I realized, why am I, why do I keep buying this stuff I'm seeing on Instagram, and I realized it was a wistfulness in me. I wish that I could buy, make this right now. I wish that I could do this. This is so pretty, and you know, just looking at it and holding it, it's almost like doing it. Once I realized that, it's like the spell was broken. So I'm trying to use what I have to. Um, and that may lead me to have to buy another skein or two, like I've done with a, a couple of sweaters that I'm making because I had several skeins, but I needed like one more. But I'm trying not to, to buy as much. And definitely, I want to do things for the right reason. Um, you know, there's also just that cultural pressure to have. Have more. Have it now for when you want it later. Um, sort of a, it makes me think of some people I know who went through the depression. Some are like super miserly, but then there's other people who anytime something's on sale, they buy way more extra and just stock up because they have that mindset of uh, saving, you know, like, like a squirrel, squirreling it away for hard times. Um, so anyway, it's just something I noticed I was doing too, Sarah. Um, but I haven't like, uh, you know, not followed shops or anything. I just, but then again, I didn't have, um, I don't know, you, I'm sorry that I don't know the history of your podcast. You may have had a shop and you were selling via your podcast, which I think, and, and this is not a well-known podcast either, mine isn't, but yours was, I think, because I'd heard of it. Um, that would be really hard to just say, I'm cutting off this social scene I'm just going to have to cut it off because this isn't, this is stressing me out. And to cut down on Instagram followers and things like that, a lot of people would have a hard time doing that. So I think that was really cool that you did it and that you're feeling inspired again. So she's been inspired by the Slow Home Podcast and also she recommended Marie Kondo's book, The Life-Changing Art of Tidying Up, which you guys have probably heard of. I've heard of it too. Lots of people have said it's really tough. <laughs> And she said to just take it with a grain of salt, you know, there's bits and pieces of all of these things, these podcasts and books that will help you in this little journey. But um, Courtney Carver's book, Soulful Simplicity, is another that she recommends, and I'll have links to those in the notes. But Sarah, I appreciate you leaving such a, a complete uh, comment about that, and uh, you just kind of... I mean, my husband read over my shoulder. He said, look, she she cut down on her Instagram and stopped her podcast. He read it before I could get to it. And I was like, what? How do you know that, huh? And uh, he was probably like, yeah, that cold sheep thing sounds good. You know, I'm sure he's thinking that. Um, Lindsay of A Wooden Nest, she said that slow living is necessary for her mental health. And so for her, it starts with just making her home, you know, functional decluttering, organized, that invites creativity. Um, it, for her, it lays the foundation. And then she also totally agreed about what I was saying, um, that the that 90s section collection in the Knit Scene magazine looked like Delia. She said she was thinking Delia's the whole time. Uh, and I thought, oh man, um, those were the days. <laughs> uh, so Tracy, to her, slow living is putting down what she's doing for a cuddle or playing with her little one rather than finishing a task. That's sweet, Tracy. That makes me think of a, a motto I heard a long time ago when I was part of La Leche League. People before things, that's what they said. And uh, it's, it's something I believed, but I, ha I didn't have this perfect phrase for. 
And so that phrase has just been stuck in my mind forever. And every once in a while, someone will say something or something will happen and I'll think, people before things. Um, that's a, a really good way of living your life. I think that's a lot like um, Frau K's mind, mindfulness, thankfulness for um, what she has. So Jennifer, Jennifer who made, I don't have my shawl in here, she made my McMillan shawl and I showed it in one of my Vlogmas episodes. I love that shawl. I wear it all the time. I drag it around, it's like my wubba or something. Um, it's all pilled up now, Jennifer. <laughs> But it was so sweet of you to make it for me. Jennifer said she's going to edit, edit, edit. Um, that's what she needs to do for her slow living. Her son has some developmental delays and that has forced her to slow down in life. But she's thankful for it because she realized she has started to, well, that whole consumerism culture, you know, that we're spending too much. Um, she had kind of an anxiety developing and I'm thinking when you say anxiety nowadays I really believe that it's what we all call modern living I think we are all I think what counselors would have called anxiety 20 years ago 30 years ago is something we all feel to a small extent now I just can't imagine what our the next generation's life um, is going to be like stress-wise unless they rebel and and start practicing the slow living stuff right now <laughs> um, but you know Jennifer's son because things had to they were happening slower in his life with his developmental delays you know she's also having to spend more time you know you work with a child who has different issues and challenges and what a blessing it can turn out to be you know at first you think oh a delay oh that's hard for them but um, it just the whole family I'm sure has had to just slow down and see what's important you really enjoy one another more it can be a blessing I haven't experienced that but I remember the first year of my daughter's life and I commented back to Jennifer about this she cried almost nonstop. Like I slept 15 minutes at a time. I got maybe 30 minutes, 45 minutes of sleep regularly a night. I don't know how I stayed alive, honestly, like that. Um, that was the first time my hormones freaked out. And it was the stress of no sleep. And we couldn't figure out what was wrong. Um, one doctor said, you hold her too much. Well, I hold her because she was crying. Well, put her down all night. And so I sat her in a crib. And one night, I went the whole night without picking her up, and she had cried to a point of being sore throat. Um, she was a mess. I was a mess. And I said, I don't care. I, I didn't sleep doing that. 24 hours, I think the child would have learned the lesson if that was the case. And I never listened to another doctor talking like that again. And I, through La Leche League, I came across some information about allergies. Anyway, long story short, her allergies caused her to, um, you know, I would eat milk products, dairy products, and that affected her it, when she nursed. So she was, you know, sick at her stomach, and what I really believe was happening was that she had ear infections. Because to this day, if she eats a lot of dairy, say, if all of us were to have gotten sick in the house, our, where I would have just a little bit of a <coughs> cough, you know, and sore throat, my daughter would have a full-blown ear infection. And the dairy products encouraged it. They kind of were a catalyst. So she might have had really bad ear infection. And then she had a little bit of a speech impediment that she had to work through when she was in school age, you know, like kindergarten, because she probably didn't have hearing for a portion of that first year of her life. That's what they think because of ear infections, which the doctor should have seen. She had regular checkups and I brought her in extra because I was always so worried about why she cried nonstop. So anyway, got off the dairy, got her off the dairy because at that point I had started giving her a little milk in a sippy cup and uh, she was better. But the whole, my whole point to that is, is I, I saw how much I could love somebody even through hard times in that year of not sleeping and just rocking a baby every night, every day. 
I also um, got into reading about nutrition. Um, I think that's why we eat healthfully today. I think she's learned lessons, my son has learned lessons, my husband and I eat healthfully because of what happened to her. So it ended up having some blessings to it. That's a very small example because it was, like I said, just one really hard year. But um, there was a blessing to it too. Um, I noticed also like with my grandparents, helping them when they were aging, um, there would be issues and challenges that would come up and then I would find I had um, this reservoir of love I didn't know that would keep me going so I don't know it's really good for families when they go through challenges together and Jennifer my impression of your family is that you guys are really enjoying uh, living a slow life together by appreciating each other I think you've got a sweet family um, also to that segment about the knit scene 90s collection she said yes and Jennifer um, graduated when I graduated. I think that she would have been the cool girl in school I would have wanted to be friends with. Um, now Jane, uh, she commented, I told you about her comments last week. Um, Jane actually, uh, she's Rose in the Wren on Instagram. And I actually um, bought one of her project bags this week, which um, I didn't really plan to show, but I'm going to because look at what this girl can produce with the slow living, okay? I love this backing fabric. But these are her screen printed um, fabric and then this little bit of embroidery over it. Oh, and it's just little choice areas, you know? I love that. Oh, I just love this. Ah, anyway. Jane um, was saying though, for her, um, they've been trying to practice slow living for a while too. And um, for her, knitting, though it's a slow process, right? It's slow making. It was kind of stressful for her. Like she was setting these self-imposed deadlines and trying to make all the things, all the things. And you know how everybody says, make all the things. And it's said kind of like a joke, but man, we really are living that way now more and more and more, you know. I have a stressful job all day. Let me come home and relax with more and more and more, you know, knitting. Uh, anyway, she found that, you know, her cue was becoming huge. Um, her deadlines are stressing her out and they're not even real deadlines. I'm gonna read some of her comment um, because I love the way she said it and it really made me laugh. There's a shawl that when I first saw the design, I was smitten and because I enjoy photography and love thinking of landscapes to take pictures of my finished objects, I already had a plan in my mind of that FO shot. That's a little crazy, I know. I don't think that's crazy because I totally do that. The pictures are half of the fun of the finished object. And, and really, the pictures last. I, get, I can look at the picture all the time. I can't wear, this is my sexy vesty vest. I can't wear knits but a few days a year. <laughs> so anyway, she says it's all part of the creative process for me. We were planning a long weekend to Sedona but then at the last minute B said that we should go to Zion. That was where I had wanted my FO shot to be. So she hadn't cast on. I had two and a half weeks to finish a large shawl. I spent every non-working minute knitting on this thing. I strained my neck working on it, and it wasn't finished by the time we took off for the trip, but I was so close. I packed all my blocking wires and hatched plans to attach a million fringe tassels as it was blocking. And then as soon as she got to Zion, she just let it all go and hiked for three days in a row and never opened her knitting bag. That cracks me up, Jane, because that is exactly what I did when we went to Tennessee. Let me see if I can show you guys a picture of her. Um, oh, it's somewhere here. Here we go. This is, I believe, she said it's the Saturate shawl. This is the one. That's a lot of fringe, guys. Two and a half weeks for that. That cracks me up. Um, but we did the same thing with, uh, I did the same thing, my husband didn't. Um, 
after my grandparents moved into assisted living, getting them moved out of their house was so hard because I was having to explain to my grandfather over and over again why they're there and just trying to get them adjusted. I was going every day and staying a long time, like hours, to just help kind of help him feel at ease and kind of get everything set up with someone helping him with things so she could kind of get a break here and there and then there was stuff to organize with their house anyway when that whole undertaking was finished i was emotionally totally wrung out physically not doing well that's when i actually started to get kind of have the stress problems with my hormones but we were going to tennessee and i wanted to take a picture of the oh my bear sweater while I was in Tennessee. Because, you know, bears, Tennessee, that's where we see bears sometimes. So I made the sweater and you see, oh my bear is a um, tiny owl knits pattern. You see the ears and the hood. Um, I did it, you know. I, I remember on the way doing this, my first intarsia, and it looked horrible. But on the trip we planned one night on the way there and one night back to stay at a hotel. And so at the hotel, I used their iron and I steam blocked the intarsia and it looked great. I don't think this was terrible for me to have done. I, I spent more time knitting than hiking. Because personally, I needed time to just be alone and zone out. It was okay for me physically that I did this. And it was something my husband needed to learn to just back off and let me have some time to myself. The whole point of the trip was really so that I could get away from the phone ringing and from distresses and, and problems and needs because there were people capable of helping instead of me now and I needed just a little time to kind of let my heart quiet down so I did a lot of knitting just to take a bunch of goofy pictures of me wearing it outside not I have like a blog post on it with real pictures you know like not real pictures pictures from my digital camera but like Here's these of me poking up from behind some, you know, rocks wearing a, a hood. And then I, I tried, um, I did double exposure <laughs> with trees. And then one of me, this was an Instax wide because it's, it's like the old Polaroid, but it's better, the film quality. And, uh, oh, here's a picture of, um, we climbed, it was, is it called the chimneys? That was really hard for me with a slight fear of heights. That's my husband at the top. And then I'm almost, we were both almost at the top. You see there's somebody a little higher than me. I could have gone that high, but I was really proud that I got this far. Anyway, it was a good trip, but I was bizarro and I knit an entire sweater in that trip. But it is a bulky weight sweater, so that's, you know, it's not too, it wasn't too hard. So anyway, Jane um, is also going to try to do yoga regularly now. And listen to the Slow Home podcast, and she thought that the 60-minute outdoor challenge sounds great to her. She's going to be doing that. I'm not, like, trying to do that challenge, but I am getting outside every day. I usually get 30 minutes no matter what, but my new next step for slow living i'm going to work in my garden fix it up but my intention is to get outdoors working in it also like every morning so um i like to get some morning sun and then in the evening too uh, now she recommended the humulus sweater that i showed y'all last week from isabel kramer as my big oversized sweater i don't think i have enough yarn to do it very oversized but i do have enough yarn to do birch oversized. So I think I'm gonna do birch before I do humulus, we'll see. Anyway, uh, oh, one more thing she mentioned was that giving away craft items. When she was getting rid of things, purging things, giving things away, trying to declutter her home, um, giving away craft items was the hardest for her. She found that uh, if she knew they were going to a good home, a place where they would actually be used, it was easier for her. And she thought that was kind of silly, but I don't think it is. I, I really get that. You want to know that someone's going to enjoy it or appreciate it because it mattered to you. Even if you don't have time for it now, it's, it's a valid thing. It's a good thing. 
So um, I did have one comment from someone, WT3001. They said, if I become slower, I will be an actual slug. But last but not least, oh, I've talked a long time about your comments, but I really liked hearing what you guys had to say, and I'm sure you're liking hearing each other's thoughts on slow living. Deidre, oh Deidre. My husband looked over my shoulder when I was reading your comment too, and he goes, what are you talking about on your podcast? Slow loving? Because <laughs> you had a typo. Um, Deidre said that um, she's really enjoyed thinking about slow loving. <laughs> but she meant slow living. Um, she's trying to be mindful of how she spends her time. Not just all the busyness but really considering why am I doing this and how do I want to spend my time. She's shopping less, which is our theme, I think. Um, and then she, I, I thank you, Deidre, for the prayers while I was on the mission trip. I really appreciate that so much. Um, I could feel that I was being prayed for at times, definitely. Okay, now Deidre is the one who, a few episodes ago, I asked for recommendations of you know, good knitting resources for beginners because she had just started knitting in January. Okay, it's the beginning of March. Deidre's already knitting socks, Rose City Rollers, and I'm just thinking, what? How are you so awesome? <laughs> I dreaded learning to knit socks. I saw a really cute pair in um, a Christmas hand knit, a Melanie Follett Christmas hand knits book, and I, uh, I wanted to do them. I did them but I definitely threw that project against a wall at least twice, angry with it. Um, it was hard, and then I dreaded the idea of socks for years after that. It's, it was like four years ago that I knit my first real pair, I mean, that I understood what I was doing. Now I'm doing them more, but uh, my hat's off to you for trying socks already. That's just great. Your creativity is... Uh, you're definitely enjoying that aspect of slow living. Um, I, one thing I'm seeing through everything you guys are saying is that a lot of the clutter in our life has to do with our consumer culture. And uh, I listened to an episode of a podcast talking about our consumerism and what's at the heart of it. Why are we locked in this cycle of buying? And the, the podcasters felt like for them it was... Um, I think this was the slow home podcast, in fact. They said they felt like it was just status, having this nice thing. Even when they edited their home with a lot of stuff, they ended up buying more stuff that was slimmer, you know, slimline and minimal, but still more stuff that kind of said, this is how I want to be perceived to the world. Maybe it was modern or it was neat or it was edgy or whatever. Um, they felt like it was status. And I had said why when it came to buying yarn. I felt uh, like I had a little bit of a compulsive nature there for a year or so. Um, I think for me it had to do with a, a bit of an anxiety, like I'm never going to get to knit again. I mean, I was knitting the whole time, but uh, I was making tons of mistakes on what I was doing. It was fretful knitting. I was interrupted. I was often in waiting rooms and doctor's offices and stuff. It just, by someone's bedside, it wasn't... Um, at all what we like to think of as, you know, oh, what is it that everyone's talking about? Hugue? Uh, cozy? <laughs> it wasn't that. It wasn't really even therapeutic because I was just a mess. So I think for me there was some anxiety, like, like it was um, medicating, self-medicating. If I buy this, I'll, I'll get to use it. I'll get to do it. Um, like I said, like a placeholder for the future. That is a sort of self-medication. That's not good. That's not a good reason to buy. Um, other times in my life, and I'm talking about buying cheap resale stuff, I still realized, you know, I'm going and shopping resale too much. I don't need this. Why am I doing this? It was like self-medicating is what it was. It was something to do, something to do with bored kids at home. And uh, it took my mind off things. And in some cases, I was uh, maybe thinking, well, I need to stock up on this or that, like that Depression-era mindset. We might not have much in the future because we've had spells in our marriage where we didn't have much. So, anyway, 
that's just where my thoughts were on the whole um, uh, sorry I was reading everybody's things um, on this whole concept of our consumer culture and how we can slow things down and I'd like to know from you guys it, have you tackled that? I mean, some of you have said what you've done. Sarah said she she stopped the Instagram ads, which, you know, Instagram used to not be ads. I got on Instagram because I loved Polaroid photographs. I, I loved using my Polaroids. I liked, um, but you know, you couldn't get film for certain ones unless you use the Impossible Project, which their film was always kind of janky and expensive and you know, there's, there were other instant cameras, you know, one thing leads to another and I have a couple of instant cameras, but the idea of a digital instant picture was really cool. So when I first did Instagram, I mean, I, most of my pictures are just phone pictures, kind of trying to be a purist with Instagram. And I did it to take pictures of things happening in my life, but images I like to look at. But there is a lot of advertising happening there, and I, I, don't, I find I don't enjoy it as much. I like seeing what people are doing, and honestly, I don't enjoy seeing staged representations necessarily of what people are doing. Now, don't get me wrong, I mean, I've got knitting around me, I've got a glass of tea with me, but um, I, this is not, like if you were to look down, this is not an Instagram-worthy view. There's dog hair on the couch. There's, um, you know, my stuff's piled around me. I just, I feel like sometimes we're staging things. So in that respect, a lot of what we're buying into and, and seeing constantly is a, an illusion or a status thing. It kind of is a status issue, I think. So anyway, I would, I'd be interested in your thoughts on all of that. Um, this talk of um, pressure and stress, it sounds like consumerism is integral to the problem. So, you know, on the Slow Home podcast one day, they were talking about finances, and they had someone who helps people with their finances. Um, they said for them, the couple that do the podcast, that it came down to status. That when they would get rid of something, you know, their home was more minimal and clean. They replaced it with something kind of streamlined, but still something they didn't need. And they finally had to come to terms with, why are we doing this? And it was status. We want for themselves to know that this is the station we're at in life. Um, Sometimes having a certain design style in the home, an aesthetic, you're wanting to show people your aesthetic, your, that's a status thing. Um, it's not necessarily saying, look at all the expensive things I have. When we think of status, you know, that's kind of what we think of. But there's a status to being, um, uh, having a beautiful, beautifully curated home. Um, um, you know, just, I don't know, I said I want collections of my books and my music, maybe there's some status to that, you know, that this is how I'm perceived by people who come in my home. I kind of don't think so, though, because nobody comes in my home. <laughs> my, my son's friends do. Um, pretty much just family. We really don't have people over. Um, that's just not something we've done much here in this home. Uh, but maybe it is. And what about the whole Instagram thing? You know, Sarah uh, got quit following shops on Instagram because of the pressure to buy and to buy and to buy. Are we buying on Instagram? Crafters in general, I'm speaking to you. Is it a status thing? Is that why we're shopping for so much yarn? Um, I know there's just the the mental trigger of limited time, small quantities, hurry, it's a coupon code, it ends. There's that, right? We we just kind of knee-jerk by. But and when I step back and I realized, you know, and, and I wasn't like indebting myself by buying this. It was within my budget to spend on craft stuff. But then I thought, you know, I don't really even need this budget. Not really. So um what are what you guys think? For for you, is it a status thing? And I don't mean that in an ugly way. 
because like I said, um, uh, it might be that some of the things I collect in my house, there might be a little status issue there. I don't know. It's worth thinking about. Um, it also makes me think about where am I heading with this, with this podcast. I watched lots of different podcasts. Um, a lot of them are people who have something to sell. And that's sometimes where the podcast begins. A lot of times I think people just start and they get followers and then they start trying to sell something. I think a lot of times we think that making a business of something we enjoy, you know, that that is a wonderful, fruitful point for what we're doing. And that that's fine. That can be for some people. But like for me, I'm doing this to connect with online friends. That was my sole reason for doing this. I, I'm talking to a camera, but I feel like I'm talking to you guys. And then, look at all these comments. I wrote them down. <laughs> all these comments, you're talking back to me. That is so priceless to me. That's where this started. I want the conversation back and forth. So I don't think I want this to morph very much to anything else. Because what would be the point? Um, you know, um, I'm like, I, you know, I showed, I showed this bag, but I'm not trying to sell things for Jane. She didn't ask me to hawk her products. Um, her shop is little. It's, it's, a, uh, it's just, I was so proud of her handwork here. Um, and then we're reading about her and you can see her comment, her beautiful life that she's creating and this, one of the beautiful things she created, but I don't want to be like showing things, stuff and things, and look what I got, and look what I got, and look what I got. I don't know. Um, it That hasn't really been an issue because this is number six, you know? But if it were to go on, I, I see a lot of people and I don't think I'm ever gonna be big stuff. I think. I talk too much for this to be, like I haven't even talked about my knitting yet, so I don't think this is ever going to be super popular, but if it were, you know, people start to send you things, hey, you know, so that you'll show it. I don't know, I love the idea of showing things people make and helping makers, but I don't think I would want to have 30 minutes of, and then I got this, and then I got this, and look at this, because that is that consumer culture. Um, but there's a way to to do it in its place here. I don't know. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I, I, I just, uh, I know what the vision for this was for me. I'm sure it will change and alter. I know I'm going to keep it up this year. Whatever happens past that, I don't know. I think I've got a good year in me for this. Maybe, probably longer because my blog is 10 years old, you guys. And there were years where I didn't get to post much, but there's something there. I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on this. And, and as we talk about this, somebody mentioned to me YouTube comments. Not always the best place to have a good, safe conversation. What do you guys think? Would a Ravelry group be better? The thing about Ravelry groups is that people start them and then they never visit them again. Once they have a certain number of followers, they just don't make an appearance. They might get moderators and that's fine. I mean, and if your point of your group is your business, then sure. But what if you don't have a business? I mean, why have a group if you can't even say hi? That's why I'm hesitant to do that because logging into Ravelry, it's just not as easy on your phone or your iPad or whatever on the go. YouTube comments are super easy to respond to and I thought that mo more of you would probably want to respond via YouTube. But what do you think? I mean, if you guys felt better about a conversation in a more closed zone like Ravelry, tell me. Uh, I'm totally open to a Ravelry group. I love Ravelry groups. I'm a moderator in one. I love interacting on them. There is my blog too, but YouTube, when you're on YouTube, it seems to be way easier to just comment on YouTube. I've never been a commenter or a liker on YouTube. I used to just watch on Apple TV so there was no easy way to like or thumbs up people. And once I started this podcast, or maybe it was the Vlogmas, 
I started noticing when I logged in on YouTube on my computer, oh, I've got thumbs up. And it's like, it, oh, I could have been thumb upping everybody, you know. Um, and then the comments, I really appreciate them. I want a conversation. I hadn't been conversing with people whose podcast I watched. So um, it kind of opened up a doorway to me. But um, do you think YouTube's best or Ravelry? for um, giveaways and conversations. I okay. Knitting stuff. Oh, I showed you Oh My Bear, but that's really old. Um, I gave my daughter my The Edge sweater. Stay tuned, one of you is going to hear at the end of this what your, um, who won? <laughs> I have three skeins of Cascade Eco in this lichen colorway. Or is it lichen? Hey, Jesse? 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 Yeah? Do you pronounce lichen, lichen or lichen? It's lichen. Thank you. It's lichen. <laughs> um, it's really great. I don't think you can see. There's like hints of yellow in it and red. Oh, you can. See that? Ooh, I love it. I'm gonna make one for me and I'm gonna make a size bigger, the edge. It's gonna happen, but it probably won't happen before Iceland because I'm thinking it might not be the best layering sweater to wear. Because I have to, you know, maybe we're wearing shirts under it and a coat over it and it's gonna be big and thick. It's gonna be really thick, you know, I just, I don't know. We'll see, maybe it will. It was like a two week knit. Um, so I've got that happening and then, um, Here's my progress on Weekender. I haven't gotten to, like I said, the stupid blog stuff um, kind of took over last week, last weekend, the knitting, but I have a sleeve on the Weekender. I love the way these shoulders look. Do you see that? And then I'm almost done. This sleeve is gonna be finished tonight, you guys. So the, the fit is great. You can see it's really wide. The bottom looks like it's kind of tight, but my ripping, as soon as this gets wet, it's gonna go and just kind of pop out. It always does. That's why I knit ribbing tight. Um, I, I use smaller needles, and I think she directed to, but then I knit tight on the small needles. I really love this neckline, the way she did it, and I love these shoulders. So you see when it's on? How the shoulder placket looks. I'm sorry, I'm all over the place with the camera. Anyway, this is going to be a nice one, and Jane had said this might be the oversized sweater I need for Iceland. That's probably true. It looks like it will be. I didn't, I wasn't quite thinking about that when I planned to make it, but I have a whole skein of this Cascade 220 left. <laughs> I bought enough. I could have made it even longer. Um, and this was the reason I had the bag with me anyway. I did cast on something new just because I knew the sleeves were fixing to go on that. And um, I got, um, by the way, my edge sweater and this weekender, I'm using, I'm entering the commercial knit along with our commercial yarn along with um, Amy from Stranded Dye Works, her podcast. I mean, it's not. I'm not being super active over there. I think she just encouraged me to use my commercial yarn. I had those two yarns already. I actually had this one too, and it's a commercial yarn, so it kind of counts. But I think that yarn along is about to be over. I also, um, I wanted to do Hohi Locatelli's The Bulky Easy One, and it's, I showed it to you already. Uh, it's a big, oversized, comfy, simple drop shoulder uh, sweater. I'm going to do it. Let me show you a picture. I'm going to do it in this yarn that I've seen in yarn stores since I began knitting. See the fit on this? Let's see if we can get it not with the glare. Here we go. Isn't that a great oversized fit? There's a lot of these. She has six, 16 inches for me. I already was going to have to knit, because I'm using worsted and not bulky, I was going to have to knit 
a size larger, I thought, but for 16 inches of extra ease, I'm actually gonna knit a few sizes larger. I'm gonna do the 3XL. It's the second to last largest size. And, um, and I think it will just, I don't know, I'm hoping it'll average out to be a size, maybe size large. Um, the medium is really big though, uh, because she has the, the ease fit into the, the sizes. So they're all oversized from what they normally would be. But anyway, this is that fun Patton's black tweed. And you see all those little rainbow flecks? It's just fun yarn, you know? I've always seen it. I've never used it. Because, you know, rainbow flex, it's not everything calls for that. But I felt like this was a good basic pattern to have a little fun with that. Plus, um, I could use a black sweater. And black isn't much fun to knit with. So, black with rainbow uh, flex might be. So, this is as far as I am on the first piece. So, you knit, uh, you'll knit one, I'll knit one side to about where the arm armholes will end and then I'll knit the other side the same way then I'll join them and begin knitting in the round to the bottom. This is great just sitting and relaxing knitting, movie theater knitting, TV knitting, driving knitting. It does it all. And that's what I'm a uh, and I really haven't done much else but is that the end of the world if I um don't have something finished every episode? I think that's fine. We're doing slow living talk, right? So, what I would like... First, I want to thank you all for answering me about slow living. You all gave me so much to think about. Um, first of all, I'm not alone with needing to edit my life. I'm not alone with having come to grips with the fact that I've spent more than I need to. And I appreciated you guys' honesty. and. Um, and then just reminders to take it slow, enjoy the moment, be thankful, uh, people before things. Um, but the whole buying and consumerism thing really seems to be a big deal. And our place in it as crafters um, and social media uh, I'd like to hear more of what you guys think about it. So the winner of the Edge Sweater giveaway was Birch Point. Congratulations. I'll have already contacted you at, by the time you see this on Ravelry, and you should have received your pattern already. Please um, keep me updated on your progress uh, if you don't keep up with your Ravelry project page. I would like some kind of, I don't know, private message when it's done. I would just like to see it because I really love that pattern. I'd like to see what you do with it. You know, I want to knit one myself, another one. Um, for everyone else, thank you for not just entering in the giveaway, but for all of your comments. They were very thoughtful and instructive. Um, I found them interesting, and I appreciated you adding to the thoughts here about just what we're currently talking about. And, can you know constantly letting the conversation evolve. Thank you for your participation. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.